Hey, welcome back to Critical Thinking. Last time we finished up, at least for a while, our overview of induction, scientific method, and empirical observation. Today, we're going to be moving away from empiricism and focusing on what is more purely rational, specifically deductive logic, which is something that I've been promising we'd get to for quite a while. So without delaying any further, let's go ahead and jump right in. Whenever we move to a new topic, it's good to begin with an introduction, and even though I'm going to be focusing on deductive logic really for the first time in this series, I have introduced it on numerous occasions in earlier videos, particularly in episode 5 when we discussed deductive arguments and distinguished those from inductive arguments. But since it's been such a long time, I'm going to start our official introduction with some review, and what better place to begin than argument itself. We know that an argument is a structured group of statements or propositions intended to perform a rational persuasive task. We also know that there are both deductive and inductive arguments, but all arguments have the same two basic parts, premises and conclusions. One or more of the statements is the conclusion, and the other statements are the premises. The conclusion, or our final resulting claim, is supposed to follow from the premises, the initial supporting claims. The purpose is to convince the reader that the conclusion is true, assuming that the premises are true. And you know what happens when you make assumptions. That's right, you can actually begin to reason. Now, when it comes to deductive arguments, one of the most important qualities they can possess is validity. It applies only to deductive arguments, and it's a characteristic of argument itself, not claims within the arguments, the propositions. We want a valid argument, and we want to avoid an invalid one. So, we need to master two things. The concept, understanding what validity means, and the rules or techniques by which we can test for validity. We'll explore some of the tests over the course of several upcoming videos, but for now, let's get the concept down. When the conclusion of an argument follows from its premises, really follows, we say the argument is valid. Or better, an argument is valid whenever its premises are formally related to its conclusion in such a way that it would be logically impossible for all premises to be true and the conclusion false. So, in a valid argument, if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. And notice the if. This is going to be important. The other desirable quality, and which strictly speaking belongs to the parts of the argument, not to the argument itself, is truth. We want a valid argument, and we want it to contain truth. Validity, we could say, is a truth preservative. True premises will lead to a true conclusion if we have validity. So given validity, true premises guarantee a true conclusion. Now, the question is, can a valid argument result in a false conclusion? Well, yes, absolutely it can. Remember, validity is a property of a conclusion's formal relationship to its premises. If the argument is valid and if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. We need both. If we have both, validity and truth, we have a sound argument, and this is the gold standard. A valid argument may, however, have a false premise. If a conclusion is false and the argument is valid, then there must be at least one false premise. And if the conclusion is false and the premises are true, then the argument must not be valid. Now, the next question, can a valid argument with false premises give us a true conclusion? Again, yes, but how? How is this possible? Well, we've seen this before, but let's review this little series of arguments one more time. All dogs are four-legged animals. Scooby-Doo is a dog, therefore Scooby-Doo has four legs. This is a valid argument, it has true premises, and we have a true conclusion. Things right now look pretty good. Here's the next one. All dogs are four-legged animals. Big Bird is a dog, therefore Big Bird has four legs. Again, this is a valid argument, but here we actually have a false conclusion. And it's clearly the fault of the minor premise, premise number two. Big Bird is not a dog. As we said, we wouldn't have had a false conclusion if it weren't for a false premise. That's impossible in a valid argument. But here is the bizarre one. All dogs are two-legged animals. Big Bird is a dog. 
Therefore, Big Bird has two legs. It's a valid argument. We have two false premises, yet we still end up with a true conclusion. Remember, validity merely says if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. It's a logical mistake to think the premises not being true mean the conclusion must not be true. And we're going to deal with this when we get to propositional logic down the road. But for now, just note validity doesn't say anything about false premises guaranteeing anything. So we're talking about formal logic, the branch of logic concerned with the principles and methods of deductive reasoning, deducing conclusions from propositions. Formal logic deals with the form of an argument, how premises are structured. All cats are dogs, Tom is a cat, therefore Tom is a dog. As strange as it sounds, this argument is valid due to the structure. If the first premise were true, the conclusion would have to be. Just change the word dogs to mammals and you'll immediately see that there's no problem with the form of the argument. Since formal logic is concerned with the form of an argument, we want to pay attention to the structure of an argument more so than to the content of the propositions. This is the difference between formal and material logic. Both are obviously important, but as we just saw, a nonsensical premise doesn't destroy validity. We do care about the truth of our premises, but when analyzing form, it's often useful to replace words with symbols to more clearly reveal an argument's structure. And in doing so, we necessarily hide the content. And since clarity is always important to make sure we're clear on our terminology, just one more time, an argument cannot be true or false. Premises or conclusions can be true or false since they're propositions. An argument can be, however, valid or invalid, while well, premises and conclusions can't be. Which brings us back to propositions, also called claims or statements. I prefer propositions since people generally don't use the word very often outside of philosophy and therefore don't misuse it as often as the other two. Let's review and let's be very precise. A proposition is the meaning of a declarative sentence. And a declarative sentence is one which makes a truth claim. Therefore, a proposition must be either true or false. So consider the following and ask yourself, are these declarative sentences? Do you want to go to the movies? Now, a simple test is to ask if that's true. And since that seems like a very strange thing to ask, in fact, the very act of asking it would involve a category mistake, the answer has got to be no. It's not a declarative sentence. What about take out the trash? Same test, same answer. No, it's not. How about Groovy. No, it's not even a sentence. Questions, imperatives, and exclamations are not declarative sentences. An exception could be something like a rhetorical question, which of course functions like a statement. Didn't I tell you to take out the trash? Effectively means I obviously told you to take out the trash. And exclamations can be used while making claims, like that was an awesome movie. And since people can clearly disagree, it must have a truth value, even if it's a subjective claim. Now, with all this talk about deductive sentences, you might think they were the same thing as propositions, but are they? I mean, isn't this what we just said? Well, let's look at a few. We have to work hard. We need to put forth every effort accomplishing our tasks. We must labor diligently. It is necessary for us to work hard. Nekeseas nobis strenue laborare. These are five different declarative sentences, clearly. But there's only one proposition, because a proposition is the meaning of a declarative sentence. And this will be essential to any work we do involving translation, as we'll soon see. It's also the reason people are able to communicate with people who speak different languages. Now, over the course of the next several videos, we're going to concentrate on and reason with five types of propositions. The first is categorical. And we'll handle what we call categorical logic on its own before we deal with the following four, which are hypothetical, disjunctive, conjunctive, and biconditional propositions. And we'll handle these together as we explore what we call propositional or truth functional logic. But as a preview, let's take a look at each type right now.
Categorical propositions are propositions that can be analyzed as being about relationships among classes or categories of things. They affirm or deny that one class is wholly or partially included in another class. Or we could say they include or exclude all or some of one category X in or from another category Y. For example, all dogs are mammals. Or some dogs are not German shepherds. And because we can either affirm or deny wholly or partially, this allows us to further subdivide categorical propositions into four subtypes. We have universal affirmatives, affirming something about an entire category, all are. Universal negatives, denying something about an entire category, no are. Particular affirmatives, affirming something about part of a category, some are, and particular negatives, denying something about part of a category. Some are not. Next, we have hypothetical propositions, also known as conditional, which is a compound proposition in the form of an if-then statement. If A, our antecedent, then C, our consequent. For example, if I let go of the pen, then it will fall to the ground. But no, the structure does not express a causal relationship. In other words, A is not said to be causing C. The antecedent's relationship to the consequent is merely that of a sufficient to a necessary condition. Terms we've definitely used before, but since they are so important to grasping hypothetical arguments, we can't review them often enough. So I'm going to do it now and again when we get to propositional logic down the road. A sufficient condition is one that guarantees another condition. The antecedent is a sufficient condition guaranteeing the consequent. A does not cause C, but A is sufficient for C, meaning it's enough to let us know that C obtains. The truth of A guarantees the truth of C. If A is true, C has to be true. If A is the case, then C must be the case. That's all we're saying. A necessary condition, on the other hand, is that without which some other condition cannot be, but it doesn't guarantee anything. The consequent is the necessary condition for the antecedent. C does not cause A, but A cannot obtain without C. C is necessary for A to be the case. Now my favorite example is this one. If fire, then oxygen. Fire is not the cause of oxygen. Clearly, it's not a causal statement. Fire is the sufficient condition for the condition of oxygen because if there's fire, there must be oxygen present. The presence of fire, our antecedent, guarantees the presence of oxygen, our consequent. Why? Because oxygen is necessary for fire. Oxygen is the necessary condition for the condition of fire. You can't have one without the other. The presence of one is required for the presence of the other. Yet oxygen does not guarantee fire, which is a really good thing, or we'd all be in trouble, right? A disjunctive proposition is a compound statement built around the connective or, or either or. For example, either Batman is the world's greatest detective, or he's the world's greatest martial artist. A disjunction is either the disjunctive proposition as a whole, or more properly, the connective itself. A disjunct is one of the component parts of a disjunctive proposition, located on either side of the disjunction. There are two types of disjunctions. The weak or inclusive disjunction, one taken to mean that at least one disjunct is true, but they both might be true. For example, either Caesar ate chocolate ice cream last morning, or he ate coffee ice cream. There's no reason he couldn't have eaten both. And the strong or exclusive disjunction, one taken to mean that only one disjunct is true and the other is false. This typically involves some type of contradiction, two contradictory or contrary disjuncts. For example, either the term paper earned an A or a B, which is not an A. A disjunction is considered true as long as one of the disjuncts is true. A conjunctive proposition is a compound statement employing the connective and, or both and. And sometimes a conjunction but can take the place of and. For example, Bernie Sanders wanted the nomination and Joe Biden got it. Or 
Bernie Sanders wanted the nomination, but Joe Biden got it. They both mean exactly the same thing. A conjunction either refers to the proposition as a whole or the connective itself, and a conjunct is a component part of a conjunctive proposition located on either side of the word and. And a conjunction is true only if both conjuncts are true. And lastly, a biconditional proposition, which is a compound statement that asserts that its two component parts have the same truth value. They're materially equivalent. Statements are materially equivalent if they have the same truth value for all assignments of truth value to their component parts. They always imply one another. The customary connective phrase is if and only if. For example, Bruce fights crime if and only if he wears a bat costume. A, if and only if, B, which can be translated into a conjunction of two hypothetical propositions. If A, then B, and if B, then A. If Bruce fights crime, then he wears a bat costume, and if he wears a bat costume, then he fights crime. A biconditional is therefore both a necessary and a sufficient condition. It's true if and only if both components have the same truth value. Now, I know that was pretty quick going through the different types of propositions, but it's a good place to stop for now. Next time, we're going to be focusing in on that first type of proposition, which are the categorical, and we're going to begin an investigation that's going to last a couple episodes of categorical logic. So until then, take care, and I'll see you in the next video.